We welcome you again to this session of the fourth Nobel Conference. Sir John Eccles is a veteran in that he has participated in, this is the second of the Nobel Conferences. He has also served as our counselor in the preparation of this conference, is responsible for several of the suggestions with regard to both personnel and themes. Many of you will recall from last year his highly instructive and provocative statement with regard to evolution and the conscious self, out of which indeed came the general framework for the conference this year. He will speak to us today or tonight on the experiencing self, looking out upon this evolutionary process from the point of view of the self that is experiencing it, I assume. I'm very happy to present to you Sir John Eccles. <laughs> President Carlson, distinguished participants and visitors and students. Yes, I am talking about the experiencing self because I believe this is central to this whole conference series, the uniqueness of man. Uh, it just occurred to me that uh, People are exalting computers these days, and I will only get worried about that when the computers stage a conference entitled The Uniqueness of Computers. <laughs> well, I start off then on the concept of self. What is a self? I want each of you, while I do this, to participate with me in this effort to grasp the meaning of what I am trying to say, because it is not something impersonal. What I am trying to say is something directed right at each one of you, and if you participate then and in this communication, then we collaborate, as it were, in this conjoint effort to understand what we are because this is a problem that is quite central to our being. I want to try and see how we can answer the question, what am I? It's a question that each of us can ask ourselves, and which is unashamedly a looking within ourselves, an attitude which you can call subjective and introspective. That's jolly good. I like those words. Uh, they have been so unfashionable. Uh, and uh, let's bring them back. It's time. I am not alone in posing this question of what am I. It was first, I suppose, uh, written out in that form, perhaps by many others, but Plotinus asked that. And uh, Schrodinger in his Science and Humanism, makes the statement, who are we? The answer to this question is not only one of the tasks, but the task of science, the only one that really matters. And this assessment would have been supported by Sherrington, the founder of modern neurophysiology, who wrote that great book, Man on His Nature, that Schrodinger thought of so highly. And again, by more recently, by... Eugene Wigner, by Hinchelwood, by Polanyi, and let me hasten to add, by the distinguished speakers at this conference. In fact, I rather think that we have been selected for this purpose, you know, that we <laughs> almost agree on so many things, and in fact, they even use some of my quotations uh, that I was going to use. <laughs> 
Now, I have chosen to talk to you in this field of the philosophy of the person because I wish to do all I can to restore to mankind, and by mankind I mean each living person, each one of you, a sense of the wonder and the mystery that arises when you attempt to face up to the reality of your very existence as a conscious being. Too often we hear, have statements that man is but a clever animal and entirely explicable materially or mechanistically, or that he's an extremely complex machine, and so on. You know all that story. Uh, we had uh, Professor Houston Smith spoke at exactly the same time last year very effectively on this question of computers. And uh, no one really wanted to be a computer after that. Well, <laughs> now I want to discredit these dogmatic statements and uh, try to face up to what I call reality. Now, of course, what do I have to go on? Well, I have to go on what each of you has to go on, namely your own experience of self-consciousness. Professor Dobzhansky spoke very well of that today. You can only know it in yourself, but because other people are so very much like you in all the things that, well, most of the things that matter, you give them self-consciousness too, and this is the very basis not only of our social life, but, for example, of all our communication, of all our literature. How else could you understand literature or music or any of the other communications in the arts if you didn't think of the composer as being a conscious being like yourself trying to communicate? Now, the I would say this, and again agreeing entirely with Professor Dobzhansky, because he uses the word self-awareness when I use the experiencing self. It's just the same thing. I think that I avoid the criticisms of the philosophers a little better than he do, does by this choice of words, but th let's see uh, what, they, what the philosophers really do about it, uh, because I haven't heard anybody yet who can destroy uh, the verbal form, the experiencing self. Uh, I don't know how they would start about it, except by admitting that they themselves had had an experience. Uh, <laughs> but man is unique because he alone has come to recognize his existence as a self. Now, this is, I think, uh, already been demonstrated sufficiently in this conference by the preceding speakers, that this conference justifies itself on that very simple statement. But of course, a self is not just something that is a little uh, here and now experience. For each of us, it is built upon the rich and fascinating tapestry of the memories woven throughout a whole lifetime of experiences. If we were to consider ourselves and to think what you really are, it isn't something just here and now, a momentary perception, but it is the whole of this of what you can recover by recall the, in memory of the whole of your lifetime, with all your experiences, associations, and so on. Now, mercifully, of course, we don't normally try to uh, recall everything. You know it's all around, and you could get it up, and you could remember what you did five years ago and when you had a holiday, so-and-so, if you wish to. You just have a feeling that it's all there, uh, and but we know that we can recover so much by if we retire away and search in depth by introspection, looking within. And of course the greatness of literature is amply demonstrates that this is not something that's for here and now, but it is an existence from the earliest time of literature. And if you wanted to think of a particular poignant example, you can think of Shakespeare, the play Hamlet, and Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be? That is the question. A stark, introspective examination of self. Shakespeare understood human character better than anybody else, I think. And what an experiencing self was. Who else could write more effectively, more wonderfully, about an experiencing self than Shakespeare? Then, there's all kinds of other ways of using self. We have the words selfish and 
selfless. And uh, you can think we use it as character judgments of people. Uh, the selfish people searching assiduously for, at one extreme, you see, for their own profit and advancement, and these people uh, simplifying life and uh, their associations with their fellow beings into those who can serve at their ambition and those who are threats to their ambition in the game of lifemanship, as you may call it. Uh, and there are the selfless. I should say that the Norwegian sculptor, sculptor Vigland, if you've ever been to Oslo and see Vigland's sculpture of the Column of Humanity, he demonstrates this kind of story of the selfish and the selfless. Uh, the climbing up in this column, where they're literally made by the bodies of the people who are sculptured in this great column in white stone, uh, going perhaps 50 feet high, and made up of people, some climbing up and others being climbed on. Uh, it's the struggle of humanity. But then there are the selfless. And then uh, I, I would like to just mention, and um, just as an amusing sideline, there are, of course, the consciously selfless as depicted by C.S. Lewis, and he says this, and uh, this is a direct quotation, she is one of those who likes living for others. You can tell the others by the hunted expressions on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, enough of this introduction. Uh, now, what I'm going to state is, it is that, firstly, that it's only because of and through my conscious experience that I come to know a world of things and events and to embark on an effort to understand it. And that explains why I'm a scientist. I'm trying to understand this world of things and events which comes to me as an experiencing self. This is the first side, you see. The experiencing self is primary to everything. And this is true to each one of you, no matter what activities you are engaged in. I want to stress then, and this you'll see the importance of this relative weighting of things, that in the first instance, there is a primary reality, this thing that comes before everything else. Eugene Wigner, the distinguished physicist, Nobel laureate in physics in 63, in a recent lecture, uh, made this kind of a statement. There are two kinds of reality or existence. The existence of my consciousness and the reality or existence of everything else. This latter reality is not absolute but only relative. Accepting immediate sensations, the content of my consciousness, everything is a construct. But some constructs are some further are closer, some further, from the direct sensations. You will see there that the material world he relegates to a, a secondary position. The primary order of reality is your experiences as a self. And finally, Wigner goes on to say, as I said, our inability to, to describe our consciousness adequately, and that is certainly the case, we cannot describe it adequately, to give a satisfactory picture of it is the greatest obstacle to acquiring a rounded picture of the world. That I shall come to right at the end. What are we to do about this? Uh, I shall quote further from uh, Wigner and from uh, Polanyi and from uh, Schrodinger. We heard uh, quotations from Hinchelwood by Professor Thorpe. Here is another one from the same lecture that he gave at Cambridge, a very remarkable lecture, The Vision of Nature. I recommend it to you all. It's only 35 pages. Uh, he said, To deny the reality of the inner world is a flat negation of all that is immediate in existence. To minimize its significance is to depreciate the very purpose of living. And to explain it away as a product of natural selection is a plain fallacy. Now I come, after this uh, introduction on experience, to the perceptual world. This is, after all, the world that, if you like, I'm standing here seeing you all here sitting with all your varied colors and faces, etc., in this room. Uh, this is a visual experience. You have the same kind of one in reverse. Uh, 
Now, how does it come about that I actually can get this picture and feel the reality of space and of people? Now, of course, if I could go and check it, if you like, I could walk along the aisles and touch everybody and so on. Uh, but I don't have to do that. I can be absolutely certain of this audience and its, its orientation, the size of the room and all the rest of it. How can I do that from what? From just uh, what information is flowing into my retina through the light that reaches it, made into an image, then coded into lots of impulses in the million nerve fibers from each of my eyes, and all of this gets into my brain, and in some magical manner, here you all are. This is what I am going to uh, talk about for a little while. How does this come about? Of course, it leads me immediately and I, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to what Professor Dobzhansky mentioned, the existence of other selves, because you behave and you look and you have much the same patterns of reaction to things as I have, and we communicate in symbolically in language, and so we begin to feel we're all much the same kind of people. And that I know you are all experiencing selves like me, and if you weren't, if I was completely uh, dreaming about all this, well, you wouldn't be here in this lecture listening to me. Uh, because you would say, what is this uh, uh, absurd nonsense that this lecture is about? But you come to listen to it because you yourself realize the problem just as I do. The problem of each being an experiencing self. Now, we learn to communicate then with each other. And this means uh, signaling to each other. First of all, as a baby, you know, you touch things and you wave, and I don't know what babies do now, but you do this, I, you can remember <laughs> what you did, and uh, learn, you learn later to talk, and you become more sophisticated in the use of language and gesture and sign, and more and more in life, you are exploiting more and more sophisticated and subtle methods of communication. And this is the great art of acting and mime and dance and so on, is the subtlety of communication from oneself to another. But always by receptor organs. You see, everything is going by sound or light and uh, touch and so on. And yet, with all of this, we never are, in fact, able to get closer. No matter how much you know or associated with anybody, you must communicate, and the only communications possible seem to be by, from one kind of signal picked up by some kind of receptor organ. Otherwise, you are separated. And in a sense, it's been said that you live alone and you die alone, because you can never get closer. We are separated, in fact, by the very fact that brain can't talk directly to brain unless you believe in telepathy, I don't deny it in a way, but I think it's awfully uh, inefficient anyway. <laughs> uh, you could illustrate that if I were to sit here, stand here now, just shut my eyes and think through this lecture all the time, I don't suppose you'd get very much of a message across. Uh, I have to talk, therefore, so I better go on. <laughs> So thus we come to a world of selves, each of us in the experience of inhabiting a body. Now these are all trite statements if you like, but it's terribly important. Our body is in the material world along with all the other bodies, and yet there's an experiencing self somehow associated with that, and there is this great enormous other part of the world, the living world, the biosphere, a tile hard but also the non-living part of this earth and, if you like, the whole cosmos. But let's face it, agree with Wigner, it's only the experience that is real in the first instance. Everything else is of a second order of reality and much of it, of course, we could be mistaken about. At least, so we say, we only get the most distorted signals from anything in the world. 
even our own bodies. The signals are terribly distorted because they have to be coded into this Morse system of impulses along all the countless lines, and then the thing all gets mixed up in the brain, as I'll show you in a few minutes. And from all that, we get and the, our experiences, and from our experiences, we deduce that there is a world of things and events. Now, of course, I can say briefly that the reason why I can be conscious, say, of this room, and you can be conscious of anything you see, uh, as, as uh, saying I could walk all over that, I understand the geometry of the situation, how everything is, exists in space. It's because we've done all this before. If I had been trapped, supposing, you know, just to take an example that's been done, if I had had a cataract, a congenital cataract that I'd never seen at all, except the milky vision. And then my eyes had suddenly been given correct vision by removal of the cataract and lens correction. Under those conditions, my vision, although it's now perfectly restored to normal, with all the equipment of communication from the retina through to the brain, etc., will tell me nothing. It's completely useless. I can make nothing of this. The world I have learned as a blind person by walking and touching and finding my way around is completely unrelated to what I, I'm getting the signals, whatever signals they are, which are meaningless from my eyes. And it takes several months of training before those signals can be used by people who have sight restored in this way. This has all been very well collected in a book, Space and Sight, by von Senden, where these congenital cataract cases, perhaps 50 or more, have uh, the histories of them are already uh, brought together there. Um, you can, of course, give all kinds of other experiments about this, about how it happens. Uh, and furthermore, you can show by quite remarkable uh, experiments uh, how you can distort this world. It's being done at present time by uh, Held and Hein at MIT in the psychology department, doing very nice work on prism distortion. But you can even, uh, a long time ago, Stratton, in 1890, even, we inverted the image on the retina by an inverting prism. And uh, people with such a vision, uh, of course, everything was immediately converted. Their whole retinal images were the different, the reverse side, and the world meant nothing to them that was completely hopeless for them to work around in. But if they persisted in trying it out and trying to make sense of their completely inverted visual image, within two weeks, it was back to all right. They could now see the inverted image as if it, the world was now the right side up again for them, and they could move about it, and they even skied with an inverted image. Now, this means a complete transformation of all the connectivity in the brain. And this can happen in not only young children, but people quite old have this same plasticity in their brains to make sense again of a completely inverted story. And then if you take the prisms off, in a week you're back to normal again, and the whole show's over. You're just uh, as if you'd never done it. This gives you some idea of the immense adapt adaptability and learning performance of your brain. It means that millions of lines have got to be completely reconditioned rechanged, reconnected in functionally in order to allow this to happen. I don't, we cannot imagine really what an extraordinary performance this is of a brain. But uh, it's been done so many times now, there's no problem about it's uh, believed by all. Well, you have to do this though, it's not any good just wearing inverted uh, spectacles and sitting down doing nothing then nothing ever comes right. You've got to dare to make mistakes and bump into things and challenge the situation, and then you learn. If you don't do that, you never learn. And this is what we did, a small baby starting to open its eyes and crawl around, is making sense of its visual world kinesthetically by crawling and touching and moving and throwing things down and so on. And it's not meaningless what a baby does, it's learning fast in the, um, perhaps the most, shall we say, vivid learning period of its life.
Now, I'm still talking on perception for a few more moments. Um, now, we naively think that we see this world as it really exists with all its color, form, and texture. And that our experiences, our visual experiences, are giving us reality in this way. But as soon as you think of it, from the point of view of a physicist, you realize there's no color in the world at all. There's only wavelengths. Uh, all I get is, code is wavelengths of light and different patterns, rather, and the colors are entirely created in my own perceptual apparatus. It's the information of the different wavelengths comes, of course, from pigments of different absorption spectrum. The Nobel Prize was given for the people who worked that out just a few weeks ago. And this all comes through coded to the brain. And from all that, in some way we don't understand at all, you can get color and you can get brightness and uh, more subtly form and texture and so on. And it's the same way. There's no sound in the physical world. The sound, all sound and music and harmony and dissonance, etc., is all a creation of your perceiving brain. It's your experiencing self has that. Your experiencing self has all of these qualities. There are no smells in the world. There are only chemical substances. It's your experiencing self that has the smells or the tastes and all the other qualities of touch and pain. They're not in the world of uh, biology, outside the world of uh, the immaterial or biological world. They're entirely the result of your own perceptual equipment. and private to you. And don't therefore be too hard on the people who made ba make bad color matches in their clothes and things. They don't have the same, perhaps, uh, uh, visual equipment as you. They may be partly colorblind. 10% uh, of the males in this room are colorblind, and probably men most of them don't know it. And you can only tell by looking at their ties or something. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, and this illustrates what we, a way we handle it, this external world, then, we agree upon that it has got color, and just because there are people who disagree, uh, we, we're not really worried so much about that. It's a quite common sense way of handling it. When somebody says, look, this matches that, and you know it doesn't match at all, it's quite different, you just say, well, that's all right for you, you're colorblind, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there you are. And, uh, uh, this is the correct way, of course, of handling the situation. You do it by a majority vote. Um, and <laughs> it's the same with uh, this phenyl, uh, phenyltheocarbamide, which 75% uh, of the people can uh, taste is very bitter, and 25% can't taste at all. This is a genetically transmitted deficiency. And smell blindness. 18% of males can't smell prussic acid, for example. Uh, again, these are, you have all kinds uh, of deficiencies in your perceptual equipment which alters the world for you. But the reality of the world, of course, we, don't, we, we only just say that they, they can't perceive it properly. But you'll understand then that this, the world as, that we perceive is a world with, uh, without that extreme reality about it. It's what it is because of the perceptual equipment that we have in order to, to receive from that world. Now, this attempt at the understanding, a scientific understanding of the perceptual world, I don't think I want to underestimate the perceptual world. I agree with it, of course. I dodge every car that comes at me and so on. Uh, uh, but we have to realize that we can be fooled by it. We can have illusions and hallucinations. Just imagine being confronted, if you could imagine, a mirror for the first time, and you see a reflection. And when primitive people are confronted with a mirror, they insist on going round to see what's behind and so on, uh, naturally. But there are many other kinds of illusions of this kind that will tell us how we are, as it were, the victims, if you like, or prisoners, if you like, of our perceptual equipment. Now, but this is all the scientist has to go on. He has, in the most subtle ways now, just to read his meters or whatever it is, but he has to 
uh, think up how to uh, do our problems to, to investigate. And as Michael Polanyi said, as a scientist, to see a good problem is to see something hidden, yet accessible, something in this a perceived world. This is done by integrating some raw experiences into clues, pointing to a possible gap in our knowledge. To undertake a problem is to commit oneself to the belief that you can fill this gap and make thereby a new contact with reality. Get behind the phenomena. All the time in science, we're trying to understand what's behind the phenomena. If you like a rainbow, and Newton was able to show this was refractions in a raindrop, you see. You're getting behind the phenomena of the rainbow in order to show what was the actual causative mechanism in a, a, a simpler way. This, was a, this is a scientific explanation. And so we attempt, in that same way, scientifically, to get behind the phenomena in a special way, a special method of examination, narrowing down what we do in order to see what can be behind it, making a contact, further contact with reality. And he said this commitment must be passionate. A problem that does not worry us, does not excite us, is not a problem. It does not exist. It's an adventure. And when people ask me how many hours I work or something like that, I say, well, it's not really work, you know, this is an adventure. You don't ask a chap who's trying to get to the top of Everest how many hours he's working a day to get to the top. Uh, uh, and that is the way we should look at science. Now, another strange thing to give you uh, further on this, uh, the experiencing self and its efforts to understand the world, is that even the most, you might say, abstract investigators in science, like a nuclear physicist, Martin Deutsch says, in my own work I have been puzzled by the striking de degree to which an experimenter's preconceived image of the process which is he, he is investigating determines the outcome of his investigations. The image to which I refer is symbolic, anthropomorphic, representation of the basically inconceivable atomic processes. Even there, he is thinking in anthropomorphic perceivable terms in order to come to get an understanding. And he goes on to state that the creative scientific imagination functions by evoking potential or imagined sense impressions. You see how much we are the prisoners, if you like, of our perceptual apparatus. And Gerald Holton, professor of physics at Harvard, goes on to comment, the more carefully we peer at the faces of our meters, the more we see the reflections of our own faces. Even in the most up-to-date physical concepts, the anthropomorphic burden is very large. Particles still attract and repel each other, rather as do people. They experience forces, are captured or escaped. They live and decay. Circuits reject some signals and accept others, and so forth. The very law, uh, the language even of the nuclear physicist is replete with anthropomorphic imagery. This is far from the idea that the scientist is one of these cold, calculating people who is only concerned with attempts at measurement and the derivation of mathematical explanations. Now this is true, even more so, of our own brains. And I wanted to give you just a few uh, slides now to give you some idea of the way in which our brains work. Uh, this is not so much to instruct you about them from a profundity of knowledge, but to let you into the secret that we know so little. Because this is, in fact, the case. Is there some pointer or other? We don't. Do we have a? Ah, well, no matter. Uh, we, we don't have any thing to point with. Ah, it's just, <laughs> I'm the only one who projects slides. And, uh, uh, and so I, I think we'll have the slides anyway, and uh, I can talk about them well enough. Uh, 
Oh, that's the wrong way. I'm sorry, you started with the last one. It's number one. They're, na they're numbered in the box, number one. That's right. Well, uh, this is just to give you some idea of the size of the brain of man. The ma brain of man, you see, is much bigger than chimpanzee and these other animals. Uh, and therefore, you think the uniqueness of man is a large brain. But don't worry about that. It's wrong. Uh, there are animals with much larger brains who are quite stupid. Uh, <laughs> I've seen a killer whale with a brain four times aquarium, and it was the stupidest looking creature that swam around and did nothing. <laughs> and, uh, and the whales have still larger brains. But uh, our brain, we think, is not so much large, but it's much better quality or something. Uh, it's, in fact, rather a, a skeleton in the cupboard that we can't really look at a brain and say, there is intelligence for you. It, no such thing can be done. Now, we look at a small part of the, of the brain here uh, now, and the next slide will show you of that great folded structure you see. Uh, could you have the next slide, please? Uh, and that's what it looks like when you put it under a microscope. And you can see these little cells here, which I believe I could almost signal that way. No, I can't. Little cells there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, 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 next slide, please. Uh, which are the components, the 10,000 million you heard from Professor Thorpe. That was, by the way, counted in Chicago in 1898 by Helen Thompson. It's never been counted since. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Now, uh, here, oh, this doesn't work so well. Uh, you, there you can see uh, some of these cells drawn, and that's the way it looks. They're so densely packed, these cells, in the part of the cortex, uh, something like 40,000 per square millimetre. It gives you some idea of a cell, though. You see these black fellows here uh, with their little branches collecting information and their main stalk that goes off that hands on the information. They're like little telephone units, if you like. Each one of them, a little unit on its own with it living its own life of excitation. Next slide, please. Oh, <laughs> which end do I use? Yes. <laughs> Well, I think I can do it directly on the thing. Uh, uh, no, I can't do it because I leave the microphone. Uh, 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 microphone. Uh, we'll do it this way. Um, here you see, um, if you look just into this one here and this one, uh, small little endings that you see here, um, in here on the surface of a nerve cell. That's the way the communication goes. You have all of the messages come along, brief impulses, along these fibers and end on the surface. And there can be about 10 to 20,000 endings from other nerve cells on the surface of one nerve cell. Each one communicates then to a large number of others. And when this one is excited enough, it will fire a message down its axon and in turn be able to stir up uh, a large number of other cells. It's like a network, you see. And these are just examples of these endings, which you can't really see properly, uh, of excitatory and inhibitory endings on the surface here of the cell. But these are the basic bits of units of the machine, if you like. And the brain is really a machine. Next slide, please. And this is just to give you uh, a further example here of uh, nerve cells diagrammatically shown with their axons and the way information comes in, say, from touching or from vision, and would go up to cells like that and be handed on from cell to cell and on to these ones which go further, the big ones, and there are all kinds of other mix-up machine uh, connections there. We've only got to the stage of looking at these first stages here of the, uh, uh, the operation of the brain when messages come in. After that, the thing is really lost in this tremendous complexity. But the main point is that each nerve cell requires many hits like this at about the same time before it in turn fires off and communicates to other cells. Otherwise, it's not doing anything. And it's the basis of this, in this immensely complicated neuronal network, this must be the basis of all the performance of our brain. Next slide, please. 
And this will just show you here, like each one of these now is a nerve cell. And you can imagine that some information has come in, and each one of these is not drawn now with all its pieces, but just as a little dot. And one kind of information, say touching your finger, might start off then handing on in chain fashion, like multi-lane traffic in a highway, because they one by itself never fires another one. You've got to have a lot at each stage of the, of the transfer to fire and a lot of collusion is required, and I draw that here as a pathway of a lot in parallel going on here, a thousandth of a second per transfer. And here's another from some other message going this way, and the same cells with a crossing point can work for any number of signals, any number of memories, any number of actions. That is to say, your 10,000 million cells aren't just used for one thing. They can be used for millions of different things because of what they do at any one time is dependent upon what their other fellows around are doing and they in turn upon what the other fellows are doing and so on. It's an immensely complicated structure, what Sherrington called an enchanted loom. The next slide, please. And this gives you an idea and uh, here of this enchanted loom, if you like. I wonder if I can find the place uh, here where Sherrington describes this because his language here is, I think, worth reading out. Yes. This gives you some idea, then, of how information flows in and goes over through all each of those as will be a cell. Say, this is all diagrammatically spread out. It should be in three dimensions. Uh, but diagrammatically, and the messages are running along, as shown by the arrows, for one kind of information or another one here and circling around, repeating, and ch coming together, and weaving a pattern. And as Sherrington says, it's like, as I think, something like medieval tapestries or oriental carpets. But Sherrington says poetically, this enchanted loom weaves a dissolving pattern, always a meaningful pattern, though never a, an abiding one, a shifting harmony of sub-patterns. Now, no one has expressed it better. Just uh, to give some kind of feeling for the mode of operation of these 10,000 million nerve cells. It doesn't sound much when you're just told 10,000 million, but when you think of the immense complexity of connectivity uh, made by, say, each one connecting to 100 others, each one in turn to 100 others, you know this can be only thought out and worked out in terms of, not, of n-dimensional geometry. A hundred-dimensional geometry is required, and I've actually had people put it into five- and six-dimensional geometry just to get the, the sums out. It's fantastic orders of complexity. The organized complexity of an operating nervous system and communications going on, weaving in this way, is beyond anything in the universe. That's the uniqueness of man for you, which is his brain. And... Now, the, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. And you can have and lead from not only the surface of the brain as in these EEG records, but deep down and watch the cells firing, and a lot of this has been done, but it's still extremely primitive. We don't know anything about these patterns that I've put up there. They're quite imaginary. It's the only way we have to think, though, is in terms of these concepts of this kind that I've tried to diagram. But here you see... Uh, the uh, excited, relaxed, and so on, brain waves, with these are made from the firing of nerve cells in some collusion. But when you're excited, they're all working in this kind of relaxed way. And when you're drowsy, like this, and when you're asleep, you'll see every now and then you get brief bursts like this. That's when you're dreaming. And this can be shown, because if you wake somebody up just then, they've had a dream. If you wake them up for some time afterwards, they haven't had one, and so on. Uh, and we dream quite a lot each night, although we don't remember our dreams. But this can be well established. If you don't dream, you get really into trouble. Uh, that's true. Uh, uh, people who are awakened under these conditions, every time the EEG shows they're having a dream and you wake them up and then uh, do this for a couple of nights, they immediately go to sleep. And as soon as they start to have a dream, wake them up and they become quite psychotic and crazy in two days. <laughs> Well, now, uh, but uh, anyway, the next slide, please. And I'll just soon stop these and we'll get back to ordinary talk. Uh, this shows you when you open your eyes, this nice ticking rhythm, which I believe is due to the thalamocortical circuitry that we worked out, 10 a second, 
uh, if you open your eyes and pour in all the information from your retina along the optic nerves, a million fibers in each, uh, firing in this high frequency Morse coded manner, uh, then you destroy the ticking over and you get this fine uh, activity of broken things. And you can even do it by working out problems in mathematics, for example, or something like that. You can more or less bring the whole of the brain operation can be brought almost to a halt by trying to multiply 17 by 23. You don't do this with a few nerve cells. You must require a thousand million nerve cells to do something of that kind. And, uh, but this, again, is just the orders of magnitude. No one knows how you do these things. Not at all. Uh, but you do know that it is your brain that's doing it. And so on. Next slide, please. But if, on the other hand, the brain activity has to be, as it were, finely grained and all these patterns weaving like this, and with lots of subtlety, then you're conscious. If your brain goes whoop, 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 uh, as it does with an epileptic attack, you're unconscious. That is, if too much stereotype-driven rhythm and your brain ceases to work as a brain. And you've lost consciousness. You're no longer an experiencing self. So I'll put it this way. So far as we know from... Lights now, please. I think that's the last... Oh, no, there's more yet. Next slide, please. Uh, and there are certain areas of the brain that we know are associated, say, with speech, besides motor and touch and you know, vision and so on. And there are speech areas here which occur only on one side. If you're a right-handed person, they're on your left side. If you're left-handed, they're mostly on the right, and so on. And uh, the surprising thing has now been shown, if we talk about the experiencing self, one last little uh, titbit on this. Uh, next slide. If you chop the brain in half, this is not a human brain, but a chimp brain, but, uh, and it's not chopped as much as that in the human work. And no, there are nine cases in Los Angeles now where the brain has been cut in the middle, right down through the, the big corpus callosum, linking the two hemispheres together so that they're independent, done for intractable epilepsy, and it's, a, it's had good results therapeutically. And so you divide persons into two, having two hemispheres, and... Uh, this would be the left and this would be the right hemisphere. Now, what you find, this amazing work in Los Angeles by Sperry and his group is that uh, these are right-handed patients, all of them, and their speech is in the left hemisphere, as I showed you in that previous picture, the speech centers. And this is the only center of conscious experience. It's now just here. Their experiencing selves aren't in this hemisphere at all. This is going on perfectly normally, doing its job, receiving from the uh, left visual fields and the left side of the body, and so on, but they never know what's going on at all. They're completely ignorant of anything that comes to it or anything that it does, the movements it causes and so on, are unknown to this conscious person who's just going about her duties or as normally, but using and only one brain, one half. And my idea, different from Sperry's, is that they never were conscious in this brain. Uh, that this... Everything here normally, of course, reaches consciousness by whipping across to this side where you speak and talk and have all of your conceptual ideas. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, they're communicating backwards and forwards because this one's much better at perspective and drawing than this one. Uh, and so on. They, they have different functions. But ling language is all on, the, on, the, on one side. And that is the side, when you cut them through, that, to which consciousness retreats anyway. And there's no, ev and everything going on here, everything that feeds in and everything it does here is completely unknown to this subject. And that's all you can know. The experiencing self just tells you that nothing happens. So, uh, lights now, please. This gives you some idea of the remarkable problems confronting us in our efforts to understand the brain and the conscious self. Now, I was going at this stage uh, to talk something about emergence and Michael Polanyi and machines, but Professor Thorpe has stolen all my quotations and, uh, uh, and also put some additional ones in of his own, which were very good. Uh, I, I've got one left, though. <laughs> uh, I uh, really believe that Polanyi has something quite fundamental here about machines. That a watch, for example, 
is something that is never made by physics and chemistry. It never has been made. Until watchmakers came along, there was no watches in this world. And they'll never find any on Mars or anywhere else. Uh, they don't exist except when made by man. And all machines are of this kind, just as language in books and printing and so on is another machine for communication. And now, uh, Polanyi's point is then, of course, that machines are something not physics and chemistry. They utilize, of course, the principles of physics and chemistry. But over and above that, there are the operational principles made by the design engineer and the artificer. It's a, it's a, they're working then according to two rules, the rules of physics and chemistry and the rules of operation. And, of course, if your watch suddenly, when it doesn't work, or if you drop it in the sea and leave it there or something, uh, then it no longer becomes a watch working, and physics and chemistry takes over, and it just rusts away and disintegrates. That's good physics and chemistry. Uh, that's what happens with, to any machine that is taken over by physics and chemistry. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's ceasing to work. <laughs> uh, and uh, so Michael Polanyi's final conclusion is this. It may seem unbelievable, but it is yet a fact that for 300 years, writers who contested the possibility of explaining life by physics and chemistry argued by affirming that living things are not, or not wholly, machine-like. You see. Instead of pointing out that the mere existence of machine-like functions in living beings proves that life cannot be explained simply in terms of physics and chemistry. Of course, it is physics and chemistry, biochemistry, biophysics, and all the rest of it, are there as the substrate of all the operations. But there is something addition above, which is the form, the form and structure which is given in the building of the living organism under the coded instructions provided by the DNA with all the genetic inheritance and, of course, working in terms of the whole environment of development. I believe that, just as in biology, there are new emergent properties of matter, something not predictable from physics and chemistry. From a world of physics and chemistry, you could never have predicted the existence of life. It came. And likewise, from a world of biology, given the whole of that, you could have looked at it, as you could now look at it, and you could never imagine that it would ever be associated with consciousness. This experience, conscious experience that we're talking about, the being, experiencing beings, could not have been predicted in the evolutionary story of life. It was something over and above what evolution would have been expected to give you in the whole hierarchical development. And yet, here it is now with us as the primary reality. And of course, if it weren't for this primary reality, there would be no science, no philosophy, no knowledge. We would never know of the cosmos. There was, at least we would never know. The cosmos would remain unknown. Everything would have just gone on happening as it did before, so we say, man with his higher intelligence began to set about the process of trying to understand the phenomena and to see what was behind his experiences. Instead of trying to placate all the uh, spiritual beings which are believed to be behind all the malevolence of nature, trying to understand them instead. This is what the great quest of man has been over the last 2,000 years or so from the time of the Greeks. It's been interrupted a bit. Uh, as you know, there were dark ages and all that. Uh, but it goes on still, but don't believe for a moment that you can be sure it will go on. At any time, another dark age can come upon us. Science can disappear from the earth. You can have technology going on. You don't need to have science. Uh, to give you some example, genetics in Russia disappeared under the Leschenko regime. There was plenty of good technology of animal breeding and, all, and plant breeding and so on, but not genetics. The science of genetics disappeared. But worse catastrophes could happen. Uh, this was temporary because the world still communicates with one another and it's hard to blot out the light in any one place. The barriers let uh, fall down in the end. But 
uh, I would say that we have to understand what science is. It isn't just uh, better technology. It's, it's this creative imagination trying to understand and daring to go on into fields of adventure, never being uh, obstructed by dogmas. Dogma is the death of science. No scientific principle is immune from criticism and eventual rejection. Uh, this is what science is. It's a living adventure of understanding. Now I must soon finish. Then where do we go from here? Well, what I will say is, I go back now to this, what is our position in the world of science? I've said we're the primary reality, this experiencing self. And yet, it's virtually outside science. I showed you in these stories of the brain how little we really know, just some very rough stories about chopping the brain out and some diagrams about how messages go around but no knowledge really about how this can give us perception and experience, and no knowledge about how it can give us free will. Now, I don't argue about free will. I just say we've got it. Uh, and if you say, how can you explain it in terms of modern science, I said, we'll just reply that modern science is too primi primitive to explain it. It's not worth trying it. Uh, uh, this is right. Because free will is something which comes out of this extraordinary dynamic complexity of a waking brain. And how is something which will take us, I think, many generations to get round to. There are performances there in this organized structure of a kind that we have no concept of at the present time. So what do we do? Well, we do what's been done. As Schrodinger says, a very vivid account here, the subject of cognizance, that's the scientist, the observer, withdraws from the field of the phenomena he's trying to understand and becomes just an observer. He withdraws from the domain of nature. He says, like Newton did, I won't try and explain myself. I'll try and explain these phenomena. And that's gone on pretty well. It's what I, we're still doing, as a matter of fact, but we should know we're doing it. This is the point. We are surprised to find we're left out of the scientific picture, that there's no room in science for conscious experiencing beings. And that's simply because we've left ourselves out. You can't get back into it without putting yourself back. We must, in the end, become central to the explanation. This is, in part, rather like the story of uh, Donald Mackay that Professor Thorpe was talking about in free will, you see. You look at the man from the outside and you say he hasn't got free will, but looking at it from within, he knows he has. There's the two different viewpoints. And of course we will go on trying to understand the world through the information of our sense organs using the most extreme technical procedures of subtlety and power but you must realize that the primary reality still is left out of things, uh, efforts to understand the world. Now, I should say, first of all, that there is, in fact, no basis at all for dogmatic statements with respect to the nature of man while we are so terribly ignorant about how this experiencing self is related to this brain of ours. There is an immense problem in our efforts to build any hypothesis even that can start to close this gulf, separating these two things, the primal experience of our conscious selves and the secondary uh, reality of the experienced world and our scientific efforts to interpret it. And this experienced world includes even our own bodies or our own brains. Though when I'm asked about the problem of my brain and my mind and how do I reconcile it, I can only reply, of course, 
I am quite happy about my mind. I'm aware of it all the time. But I don't know anything about my brain. I've never seen it. I assume it's there. But uh, it's entirely a secondary order of uh, uh, well, certainty uh, about that. Now, I want to give you one further thing. As pointed out by Schrodinger, and I have even a quotation because this will sound rather remarkable, he speaks that we have, in fact, to bridge this gulf by rebuilding science. I maintain that it cannot be solved on the level of present-day science, which is still entirely engulfed in the exclusion principle, leaving the subject of cognizance out of the equation, without knowing it. Hence the antim antimony. To realize this is valuable, but it does not solve the problem. You cannot remove the exclusion problem principle by an act of parliament, as it were. Scientific attitude would have to be rebuilt. Science must be made anew. Care is needed. Science must be made anew. That's a big story. It isn't just tinkering a bit with science. In fact, what we are up for is a completely new science. And Eugene Wigner has much the same story about this revolution that is required in science if we are ever to come to terms with this dichotomy. It's nothing for the philosophers. This is something the scientists really have to do themselves because they have these two quite conflicting modes of experience to uh, assimilate to each other. Eugene Wigner says, my, if my consciousness is the only absolute reality, one would expect it to be independent of all of the secondary realities. But he points out that if he doesn't retires into a room and takes no food, air, or water, his primary reality soon disappears. That is, he becomes unconscious and so on. Uh, well, this doesn't deter him very much. Uh, uh, the, although it is primary, yet it may not be eternal. Uh, as, for example, he would anticipate electric charges and heavy particles to be. He raises the question, and this is an important one, that if we are to come to terms with this, we should do something rather strange. We should study much more the coming to be of conscious experiences after birth and also their dissolution, apparently, with death. Now, I wanted to just finish on this story of death. It's appropriate to finish a lecture with death, isn't it? Um, certainly the most poignant problem confronting each man in his life in his attempt to become reconciled with it is this inevitability of death this is related of course to our evolutionary origin and Professor Dobzhansky has spoken so eloquently about death awareness coming to man the Neanderthal man quite primitive man. I often think of Neanderthal man with great, well, what should we say, feeling and sorrow, as it were. This man waking up to this terror, a terror of existence for the first time. The lo aloneness of these creatures who came to be conscious. Re realizing for the first time that they died like other animals. But only they knew it. Uh, and, of course, this gave rise to the, all the burial customs, the ways of handling it. Man used his ingenuity, as always, building myths and religions and customs of every kind. And some of the great civilizations were almost death civilizations, like the Egyptians, who spent so much of their great technology in preparing for the fitting tombs of the great people. All to no purpose. I gave no assurance. And now, of course, man feels so far forsaken from these myths and religions so often today. That is the trouble. This is part, as I spoke last time, the burden, if you like, of Darwinism, that he feels frightened and alone. Now, I have no immediate solution, of course, for this problem that each one of us must face up to. But I want to point out, though, that there's so much unknown about our origin, of our individual consciousness. This is the point that Eugene Wigner raises. 
how do we come to have this unique individuality of our experiencing selves, each of us? It's partly, if you like, from our evolutionary origin, partly from the uniqueness of our DNA, but I would argue that this is not the whole story. This, to me, is not satisfying, because as Professor uh, uh, Dobzhansky pointed out, there are so many different unique DNAs. We cannot believe we're just one of the two to the hundredth power of DNA possibilities. Uh, the chances against our existence are so fantastically stupid that you can't believe in that hypothesis. This gives you a rise to think, what is then the explanation? There must be some other meaning. That's all I can say. It isn't that we are here just played out as byproducts, if you like, of the evolutionary story. That is okay as long as we don't have this unique experiencing selves that we have. That gives rise to the feeling that uh, there's no yet satisfactory explanation of this. We don't even know how it's related to our brain. We do know, of course, that when the brain dies and disintegrates with death, that there's no more experience naturally. If this world there's no way to communicate or receive everything, all this machinery has gone. But it is not for us to say, as we don't know how it all started, that it must just end so either. I want to point out that our terrific ignorance can be a source of hope, and that there are possibilities of existences, of our own consciously existing self, in other ways, in some other manner, altogether unimaginable to us. We don't know. All we can say is we're ignorant of the whole story. That is really hope, I think. And so then the conclusion I come to is that each of us as an experiencing being exemplifies the essential uniqueness of man. Man's attempt to understand the world is a measure of his uniqueness. But he has been misled by leaving himself as an experiencing being out of what he has regarded as the whole explanation, the whole scientific explanation. I should like to close by a little quotation to show that Socrates had much the same idea as I'm trying to express. Uh, it's a quotation from uh, the Phaedo by Plato. And uh, Socrates says, they're asking how they should bury him, he said, Socrates, any way you like, replied Socrates. That is, if you can catch me, and I don't slip through your fingers. He laughed gently as he spoke, and turning to us, he went on, I cannot persuade Crito that I am this Socrates here who is talking to you. He thinks that I am the one whom he will see presently lying dead. You must give an assurance to Crito for me that when I am dead, I shall not stay but depart and be gone. That will help Crito to bear more easily when he sees my body being burned or buried as if something dreadful were happening to me. No, you must keep up your spirits and say, that is only my body that you are burying, and you can bury it as you please. The first question, what is happening in the brain when a person takes a drug such as LSD 
can this effect be induced in the brain other than by the use of this drug? Well, of course, any hallucinogenic drugs will uh, compete for this. There are many of them. Uh, what is happening? There's nothing uh, that you can say in the detailed performance of nerve cells in the brain as yet. Uh, but what it is occurring, of course, is that various changes must be occurring in the whole of the patterning of information of pa pathways around, giving you different, essentially, experiences, perceptual experiences. Uh, but this would be extremely subtle to discover all that was involved in that. Uh, I will say only that this is what you call an hallucination, and my definition of an hallucination is simply that one chap is going through seeing all kinds of other things which a next-door man can't see at all. And, of course, you say he's hallucinated. Uh, uh, of course, you get in first. He could say you were. But uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, point about it is that normally we all agree, except for these odd blindnesses and things I talked about, we all agree over standing near each other, looking at something about what we see. We can differ a great deal with regard to the detailed uh, experiences about what you uh, taste, for example, in judgment and quality of things and so on, whether you think it's a nice frock or not and so on. But apart from that, we have general agreement. And with hallucination and all these drugs, you don't. This is the point. The brain is ceasing then to become a reliable indicator of anything in the external world. And these pathways are taking over and giving you, as an experiencing self, the strangest things, just as in dream states. Nothing is coming in. The dream state is entirely manufactured within by impulses going through these complicated uh, I, uh, weaving patterns that I described. Now, the next question. What about extrasensory perception? Perceptions. Are they facts or fiction? Well, uh, the whole point about it is I would not like to dogmatize about anything in this respect. We know so little. All I can say is that I don't believe it's been proved in any case yet. There are some extraordinarily interesting statements about it. I would encourage people to go on working if they can be persuaded to work on such a boring subject as it looks like and the way I've seen it done. Uh, but uh, we know so little that let's not dogmatize about what could happen or not happen in the way our thoughts transfer from one to another. All I'm saying is that it's very inefficient if it occurs. And then the next part of the question was the difficulty of communicating one's thoughts and feelings of self-awareness to others. And so on. Does it help, of course, to talk to other people, etc.? Of course it does. Talk all you can. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and read uh, fiction, all the literature, and poetry, and so on. Is all efforts to educate our self-awareness, our experiences, our richness and wonder of it all. Let's face up to that that the whole of life should be a perpetual education. And uh, the relationship with other self, other subtle people, this is what the gives rise to, shall we say, in an academic society. This is what gives it quality, is the intercommunication between people at all kinds of subtle levels of appreciation and judgment and criticism. By all means, communicate all you can but try to keep it fairly intelligent. Uh, <laughs> what occurs in brain cells when information is stored? Memory. Well, uh, I'll say one thing. It isn't this RNA story. The, it isn't this chemical RNA story. This must be rejected. It's much more subtle. It is bigger and better synapses. You saw that picture of synaptic connections that I had there in these pictures that you saw there. Uh, you'll notice that the communicating lines of one to another, it's there where the story of memory, micro growths there, bigger and better because of usage, something of this kind is the only explanation, what's called the growth theory of memory. I don't think there's any uh, alternative to that, but the details of it are not known, and the RNA, of course, is required for the growth, but not as a specific chemical substance uh, with all uh, so much uh, built-in uniqueness. When the brain is divided in half, what happens to the personality of the individual? The blood and nerve supply. Well, I don't know. That's all right. Uh, these people, by the way, I've seen pictures of the lady who's had it swimming in a swimming pool perfectly normally. She goes out shopping. She does everything. 
with her brain. I don't know whether she drives a car, but probably in Los Angeles they'd allow that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, they behave and go on quite well in life. They're not by any means crippled. They're much better than they were before when they were in uh, the two sides fighting each other with con con almost continual epilepsy, several big attacks a day, and now by separating the two halves, they get on fine with no attacks at all. So uh, it's a strange outcome. This is dealing me cards like as if I'm in a gambling solution. <laughs> 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 there's, there's some element of chance. <laughs> I'm told there's some chance in it. I'm wondering if there's a $64 question somewhere. Is there a known connection between biochemicals and learning or memory? Well, I will say that uh, not a chemical basis like RNA, each RNA with its specific structure for a specific memory and read out, et cetera, et cetera, nothing like that. But of course, there's a chemical basis for this because as there is for all operations of the nervous system. It requires metabolism and energy to build its connections and the transmitters and the impulses and the ion shifts and all the rest of it. And then the little growths that I think must be the basis of the connect changed connectivities so that the tracks run one way rather than another. And when you feed in, the thing goes this way and not some other way, and that gives you your memory. Um, no, uh, something about extracts from trained animals to others. No, this is nonsense. Uh, uh, it's a very reprehensible idea, in fact. Uh, the idea with being, of course, that finally comes round to that, that if you want to be successful in the examination, you eat the professor. <laughs> if you can't remember a dream, does the brain hold it in the subconscious? If so, could the dream ever be recalled? Um, I think you can't even tell that, answer that question at all, you see. Because if you haven't remembered the dream, how could you remember if it's recalled? Some... <laughs> okay. <laughs> what goes on in the brain when one is under the influence of hypnotism? Is this a subconscious working? Would the brain way that you showed be the same as the person was sleeping? And so on. Well, hypnotism is simply... Let me uh, tell you one thing. Uh, you cannot hypnotize anybody if you are not communicating with them by their receptor organs. You've got to do it through sound or sight or what you will, and it doesn't matter, you can do it on the uh, telephone if you like, but you have to communicate, that's just a distant communication. You could hypnotize somebody over TV uh, and all the rest of it, but you must get through to their receptors, and they must be susceptible to you, and then you can imagine then pouring in all this data can make the brain behave in strange ways and give strange experiences and strange performances. That is, it all is explained that way. I don't like the idea very much of hypnotism. Uh, it's hard enough for us all to be strong individual beings with our own responsibilities as it is. Hypnotism tends to break this down and I don't recommend it, therefore. We should all try to be as strong and individuals as possible, each with our own uniqueness, I think. Now, yes, I think I've got this one. Ah, somebody, well, I was just uh, in what field of medicine did you obtain the Nobel Prize? Well, it wasn't for talking about conscious experience, I can assure you. <laughs> but I, I, I can now, having got the prize, of course, now I can do what I like. Uh, <laughs> I got it actually for working on the transmission uh, between synapses, those ones, those connectivities between nerve cells, uh, the, the mode of operation of the, how an impulse from one cell communicates to another. So I suppose I have at least some authority in this story. What do you think the probability or possibility of brain transplants in the future? Uh, this, of course, uh, couldn't happen. Uh, the, um, 
uh, what should we do? Uh, if you transplant a brain, of course, if you could do it, then of course uh, uh, you would be really transplanting a body, not a brain. Uh, if uh, your brain is transplanted to somebody else's body, that becomes your body. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, the, I was suggesting that if you want to do some tricks of this kind, you should have a perfused head, you should just, uh, which is quite possible, uh, and keep it going with, uh, that's technically quite uh, possible even any time. And uh, that would be uh, much easier than a heart transplant, I tell you. Uh, with mechanical devices to keep the blood circulating and uh, diffusional devices to keep it oxygenated and fed and all the rest of it. And there's no problem at all uh, uh, technologically in doing this. But I, didn't li I would hate to see it done. But it will be done. Um, you said that during an epileptic seizure, part of the brain loses consciousness and cannot experience. The actually the whole, uh, you lose consciousness completely when the march of the epilepsy has invaded sufficient of the brain. You can be conscious with only a relatively small part of your brain still working normally. You can be conscious quite normally, apparently, with half your brain removed. And in fact, it's been done under local anesthetic. They take out the whole of one hemisphere and the subject goes on talking all the time. They take, by the way, the, for the uh, right uh, hand of subject, they only take out, of course, the right brain you would have to tell them. <laughs> because you couldn't talk when the uh, other brain was removed. Uh, but it is quite incredible how much of the brain can be removed and destroyed without greatly affecting uh, the performance of people. That is very largely because our tests are so bad. Uh, During, well, uh, the brain loses consciousness. Uh, when the epilepsy has invaded almost all of the brain, uh, then, then you do lose consciousness, of course, uh, and come back only after a long period of recovery time from this extremely exhausting uh, performance. Because an epilepsy, as we see it, is involved in total uh, discharges of all the cells, explosively firing one another, it's a kind of explosive event, and it only stops with complete exhaustion, probably by the transmitters giving out and the ionic balances failing. And then you can recover again. There are, of course, petty miles where you have just uh, a brief, strange feelings when only a part of the brain goes, and the recovery from that is instantaneous, virtually. Please explain more clearly what you mean by the conscious self being localized in the left hemisphere. Are you identifying conscious self with language? I'm only just stating what the people tell you. That's all we can know. Uh, they can only, you might say, well, they can feel it in the other side but can't tell you. Uh, I can't, uh, you, you shouldn't say that, of course, because there's no evidence for it. Uh, all I'm saying is, you see, that the experiencing person, the conscious person who is talking to you, who is reporting to you or writing or saying what he feels, he only knows what is happening in the left hemisphere, the dominant hemisphere. Sperry's idea is that the other side is knowing too and, know, and getting on quite well but can't tell you. Uh, the only occasions when uh, you can get you can get the left side to even right occasionally, and you might say that's the right hemisphere telling you something, but it isn't. It's the left hemisphere still going by some of the uncrossed pyramidal tracts getting down. There's no communication possible in this subject. You've put a complete cleavage between them. Sperry says not that they are the same individual and the other side is not communicating through. But he says there's two individuals, one's conscious and the other's unconscious, and you've given a duality now. Well, that would be all right if there uh, could be established that the other side could really ex was experiencing at all. There's no evidence that the other side is experiencing at all. By that I mean uh, he can't tell you anything, and you, you've got no other way of finding out. Just because things are going on, you don't know there's experience there or consciousness there. I'm not identifying a conscious self with language, although they seem to be identified. There's no other way, you see, of getting the information through. 
And what is certain is that the language hemisphere is not at all cognizant of what goes on in the other hemisphere. The only thing you could say is that the other hemisphere might have another self there that is unconscious. How could the experiencing self become an object of scientific study? Well, the answer is that there's a tremendous amount of work being done right now on it. In so many ways, psychophysics, all, uh, I mean, what is color blindness? What is all this attempt to work with flicker fusion and, and uh, evaluation of intensities of every sense? As the power law of Stevens has been worked out quite recently, the intensity of stimuli as against the intensity of the experience. This is the experiencing self tells you. This is twice as bright as that. This sound is twice as strong as that. And you put them in scales. People can do all this now. Uh, another beautiful work is being done by Libet, who is stimulating in conscious patients to know all about it. They're volunteers. They're being operated on. Their brain open for another purpose. And he stimulates with gentle electrical stimuli on the place of the brain where they get uh, sensations. The brain is opened, by the way, for the par paralysis adjutant's operation. And for half an hour, these subjects voluntarily become uh, subjects of an experiment, which is done with every ethical care by Liberty in San Francisco. And uh, the result is that they've found the most incredible things, that weak repetitive <laughs> stimulations take up to half a second before they reach consciousness. Although they are stimulating at the same intensity all the time, it shows you that before even the simplest conscious experience of just a fuzzy tingle in a finger or something can be appreciated by the subject, it has to have half a second of circulating impulses going through perhaps 500 synapses, going to tens of millions of nerve cells in some complex pattern. And all of this has to happen before you feel a tingle in your, a part of your finger. This is the point of these experiments, uh, and so on. I mean, uh, you could write a book about the experiments being done right now on the experiencing self. Uh, this is where psychology should have gone on with so long, but it pulled out and worked on rats instead for a long time. But they're coming back. <laughs> you see, the point about it all is that everybody, and this is a strange superstition we have, we all want to be physicists all the time and do what the physicists do in quite different disciplines. And this is absolutely mistaken. We should dare to investigate the scientific phenomena that we're interested in by methods appropriate to those scientific uh, uh, events. And the great mistake of biologists has been, and psychologists in particular, has been always wanting to get great status by being physicists and thinking that you can only do science if you can measure things. This is another great mistake. From a biological standpoint, what would you regard as the conditions which are both necessary and sufficient to account for the emergence of self-awareness? Why has man alone come to the self? I think, come, why has man alone come to possess self-awareness? And the answer to that, uh, with, uttered with all reverence, would be God knows. I think there's no other answer. Uh, we have no concept of this at all. It isn't brain size at all, as I told you. There's no evidence of self-awareness in performance and behavior in animals with much larger brains. And of course, as you know, they've been investigating porpoises a uh, crazy fella, uh, what's his name, John, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now, thank goodness, uh, uh, working with <laughs> porpoises, uh, um, and so on. But uh, there's no evidence that these animals are experiencing selves at all, and yet they have brains equivalent to ours. No, it's just one of the things that we have, uh, let's be thankful for it anyway. To be an experiencing self, how fascinating compared with this other meaningless existence of animals. And we'll take all the death awareness troubles and all of that in our stride just for the wonder and beauty and excitement of being alive and conscious. Ah, ah now I should be able to do this with Dr. Thorpe's collaboration. Would you spell the name of the man you and Dr. Thorpe quoted? Is this Michael Polanyi? Is that right? Uh, I think it's Polanyi. P-O-L-A-N-Y-I. Michael Polanyi. 
who is a, a Hungarian by origin. He was originally a doctor trained in Budapest as an MD. He then went to Berlin and had a most distinguished career as a physical chemist, became professor of physical chemistry in Manchester, England, and then after getting a FRS when he was still quite young and publishing a great deal of most, uh, what should we say, high scientific study investigations, he gave up being professor of physical chemistry and was transferred to a special department of philosophy created for him, the department of social philosophy, and he went and spent his time there, and now he is still at the age of 76, one of the most redoubtable intellects in the world today. He knows, you see, biology, originally trained as a biologist, as a doctor, and yet, and then as a, uh, a physical chemist, the world of matter, and then became uh, a philosopher, and has written extremely well on things, and today I think his performance is better than it ever was.